Hello, hello. Welcome to Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey. I'm Brandon, and this is a weekly podcast hosting hopeful conversations with optimists and world changers about the unique experiences that drive them to use their influence for good. At the end of last week's episode, I actually said, hey, we're taking next week off, but I think I lied because (laughs) I had a conversation this week and I loved it a whole lot. So I just wanted to share it this week. Um, I hope you don't mind an extra little bonus episode. This week, I got to have a conversation with Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin, two incredible filmmakers. They've got a brand new film out called LA 92. It's with Nat Geo and it tells the story of the LA riots from 1992. That's 25 years ago this year, which blows me away. The LA riots actually happened a few months before I was even born. And so I really did not have much of a paradigm, much of a context for what happened. I knew they were iconic. I knew that they were important. I knew that they were heartbreaking, but Dan and TJ's film dives into that in, for lack of a better word, is is a beautiful way. I think they did a really, really incredible job of diving into the story focused on building empathy. And I have no doubt that that was an intentional decision because all of Dan and TJ's work, they've been working together for the past 10 years, is very focused on empathy. It's focused on people connecting with other people. And that's what we believe in It Sounds Good. And I think that that's what this community believes in. And so I loved getting to have this conversation with these two talented creative artists about how to build deeper connections with people, how to use your art and your influence to create empathy. And we talked about the LA riots and Rodney King and Los Angeles and and what all of that means for America and the world today. I feel like it was a really important conversation. I really enjoyed talking with these guys. So for a little bit more context, Dan and TJ are the co-directors of this film, but they've been working together for the past 10 years. They're maybe most well known for co-directing, co-editing, and co-shooting the feature-length documentary Undefeated, which ended up winning a ton of awards, including an Oscar, which led to TJ being the very first African-American to win an Oscar for directing a feature-length film. I caught them while they were on their way to the Tribeca Film Festival, where their documentary is premiering tonight. So because of that, the audio quality is just a tiny bit less solid than normal. But again, this is a bonus episode. So let's just kind of play it off. It's cool. It's fine. I think you're going to love the content. So please excuse any rough audio. But uh, oh my gosh, let's just jump into this. It's such a fun conversation. Here we go. TJ, I was doing some research on uh, both of you guys, but I saw that you're from Seattle. And anytime that I get to know somebody from Washington State, I'm always excited because I'm from Pullman, Washington, which you probably know about. It's like (laughs) teeny tiny. (laughs) You're laughing. Um, Nobody knows about it unless they're from Washington. Uh, And so I just wanted to make that connection. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm laughing because if you're right, uh, Pullman is, uh, well, it's Wazoo, right? Yep, Wazoo, go Cougs. I, I did not go to the UW, though. I went to uh, Western, Western, right? Up in uh, Bellingham. Yeah, I stayed in state. Western is great, right? Western did is a really to, fun school. Did you end up going to Wazoo or did you, did you leave Pullman? I got out. So I felt like when you grow up in Pullman, you it's like you went to Wazoo. And so I went to, uh, I moved to Portland and went to Portland State, which is the exact opposite ah, experience right. of Pullman. <laughs> Right. But they both shaped you equally. Exactly. No. And I think that if I'd grown up in Portland and had grown up in that experience, it would have been really valuable for me to go and move to Pullman and have that opposite experience just to kind of like challenge myself right. and grow. Yeah. It is pretty interesting, even well, for both Washington State and Oregon, the, the between uh, eastern part of the state and the western part of the state, just culturally. Yeah. They they're really are different. I mean, so... When did you guys start working together? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I should mention, uh, Dan, I, I know that you're from Illinois, and I have almost no connection to <laughs> Illinois, but it sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> sounds like Pullman in my hometown of Rockford may have been kind of similar. Well, there we go. There we go. That's our connection. Yeah. Well, so you guys are from totally different parts of the country, but you guys have been working together for years now. When did you start working together? Um, I think it was... I think it was 2000. I mean, we should know that, of course, but I, I think it was like January of 2007. Yeah. So we've been working together for about 10 years now. Um, we came together. We were both hired to work on a, uh, a documentary that uh, really changed the world. Uh, it was about the world series of beer pong. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, um, I think the producers of that film, uh, put us together and they wanted to make something that was a little more, uh, frat tastic. Um, and, uh, we spent a year making a film about four people going through an existential crisis in the middle of a, uh, drinking game contest. So, um, I think our sensibilities were, <laughs> were cemented and aligned from that moment. And we've been working together since then. It's, it's pretty weird that, I mean, you're the film you made before that was, well, funny enough, I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know it's it's a very it's a you made somewhat of a a political film, um, and I made the film I made before that was, uh, you know, kind of more of a culturally relevant film, and somehow we met on a beer pong film. Yeah, everything we've done <laughs> since has all been either uh, you know uh, exploration in in culture or or race and class and for some reason this one film <laughs> is the one that we met on about <laughs> drinking it. beer pong brings people together hey yeah <laughs> it does and that's funny and so i was gonna ask but you kind of just dipped into it what would you say has been the common thread between all of your work because you've made award-winning films you've directed commercials that people love like i loved your your work for a honey made like you of course, LA 92 was fantastic. Um, what would you say is ultimately the common thread between all of the projects you work on together? I don't know that I've ever really thought about that. I mean, I, I think it's, sometimes I think, it's, I think it's dangerous to, yeah. <laughs> to examine your own work in that way. But I, I, I mean, if I go ahead, TJ. Yeah. No, I was just going to say it's, I think there's a, it's, it's surprising that it, you're even having to do this every time with your work, but essentially like we're always trying to get, uh, audiences to recognize people as people, <laughs> essentially humanizing people amidst circumstances, uh, you know, whether big or small, um, and challenging perceptions. I feel like that is a constant in, in all of the yeah. work. And it's, it kind of blows my mind that in this day and age that, uh, you need to fight an uphill battle to get people to just see people as to, to respect their realities of what life looks like for them. Yeah, I would say we do. If I, if I look at a commonality, it's often in this recent project being the kind of epitome of it, but it's, it's, I think a lot of times we're trying to look and make sense of our country and the country that we see populated by people that, you know, to us, feel like normal everyday human beings and then we see a lot of things presented back to us that don't always make sense you know I I mean I think TJ articulated it it perfectly it's 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 trying to show people as as they are Mm, that's really really good and I think you guys have done a really really good job of that like from all of the work I've seen from you guys I, I walked away with a, a deeper sense of empathy, which is, it's not something that every piece of art has necessarily. What would you say are some of the greatest tools within the actual work you're there, that you're creating to do that, if that makes sense? Like, what are some of the specific ways that you are trying to connect people to other people who are seemingly different than them? I don't want you to give away your secrets, but I kind of want you to give away your secrets. <laughs> Um, one thing we talk a lot about is just listening, uh, and that can be with like listening with our camera or just meeting people and listening to their stories, you know, really taking the time to, and trying to step, you know, even bring, removing our own preconceptions, um, which we obviously have our own biases, and preconceptions and stereotypes. And I think, you know, we try to work against that and, and listen to people 
as they are, I mean, you know, instead of coming in with an agenda, um, we, we oftentimes try to allow the subject that we're working on to tell us what it's going to be. I think there's also a benefit of having two of us in the sense that we, like Dan said, we, it would be naive of us to say that we don't have our own preconceived stereotypes or notions or uh, perceptions on things. So to have two of us there, we're kind of constantly challenging each other's um, ideas. And I think that helps, especially a lot in, in the, in the edit where it, it kind of keeps you on your toes in terms of being as responsible as, as possible in terms of when you're handling someone else's story, which I think is a, is a, is a really big thing for us. We put a lot of pressure um, on ourselves to, I think like Dan said, to not have, it's not about just our isolated agenda. It's, it's about constantly challenging what we are doing, how we're, and then more importantly, how we're presenting um, the material, knowing that, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of media literacy is a, uh, is, uh, is, is unfortunately not something that's talked about much. We just kind of consume, people just consume images, not realizing how much it actually affects their, their perception and, and, um, uh, and kind of their outlook on, on the world around them. So we, we put a lot of value in, in how we're shaping those images and how we're presenting those images and in, in trying to do it with authenticity uh, and also... Uh, being as respectful as possible to the subject matter at hand. Have you ever considered, I mean, because all of your work so far has been largely documentary with a little bit of a, a dip into the commercial world. Have you ever considered doing like a big blockbuster or anything like that, you know, pivoting in some direction, but then bringing this idea of empathy in connection to that space? Or do you feel like, your craft or the ultimate tool for you guys to do this thing is through documentary work. No, I mean, we definitely consider doing, you know, um, scripted, whether it be a series or a movie, whatever form it would take mm. for sure. You know, we, you know, we have had different projects that are in, you know, uh, different states of either never happening or, <laughs> <laughs> um, or what, what have you at studios, you know, I, I think, uh, a quote unquote blockbuster, um, is, uh, whether those, uh, allow the, um, nuance for, um, <laughs> for that type of empathy, you know, I don't know, but, um, but, uh, yeah, no, that's definitely something. I mean, we're just as filmmakers and as storytellers, we, you know, we got into making documentaries because it was the it was the one path that we could really just do it ourselves at the beginning. There weren't any barriers to entry. We didn't have to ask somebody permission to make something. We could just go and make it. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, though, we want to make films um, and we want to make art that is telling a story and hopefully communicating ideas and making people think about their existence in, in some way. And um, and so whatever form that takes, I think we're, all, it's just, um, you know, look, if someone wanted to give us $200 million, to make a film, <laughs> I don't think we'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one of our listeners has got 200 million bucks for you. <laughs> um, along those lines and along the lines of what you said a minute earlier about, uh, getting rid of your own preconceptions. Let's talk about LA 92. I got to watch a screener of your new documentary the other night with my wife, um, and we actually went into it with almost no preconceptions, not intentionally like you guys, but basically by fact of of age and in some ways privilege, you know, because I was born months, just a few months after, uh, you know, Rodney King and the end of the riots, um, and then as somebody who has lived most of my life or I mean all of my life really as a white person with privilege who who maybe is not affected by Rodney King or you know the legacy of that or the riots for years I've never really had to think about it and and so I kind of came into this documentary with little paradigm for what was going on and what I really appreciated about your film is I feel like you brought me into the moment. It wasn't, it didn't feel like I was looking back on 
the LA riots, it felt like I was experiencing it from the actual time. Like I felt like I was in the middle of it and I didn't know what was happening next. I didn't know what, like what the outcome would be. And it was powerful and it felt important. I was wondering what role has this historic moment played in your lives through the years? Was this something that became of interest to you more recently? Has this played a role for a long time? What does that kind of look like? I mean, I would say that, uh, I don't know, this is Dan speaking, and I don't know that it's played a, uh, um, a role throughout my whole life. I remember it happening. I remember being shocked by the images that I saw, but I was 13 or 14 years old, and um, I don't think I fully understood necessarily what I was watching. Um, I think when you know we were approached to direct this, the, the producers had set up the project just based on the fact that it was the 25th anniversary of the events. And um, when they asked us to do it, we said we would agreed we would do it, but we wanted to make the film entirely with archival material. And we didn't want to um, have any interviews or voiceover um, for the exact reason that you described. We wanted to put an audience in the moment and to feel the visceral nature of these events. Because when we started researching and watching this stuff, it was, it's really, I mean, for, I don't know the better word than just crazy um, that these things happened and that, you know, there's someone in the film that says the phrase, this is America. And, um, you know, I, I think when you watch this, it might not, for a lot of people, it might not square with their image of America. And that was something we wanted to explore. And I think, you know, when, when you were, when you were leading into the question, you said, you know, that from your existence, this maybe didn't affect you, but I would argue that it does. I think it affects all of us. And I think we are, we are all complicit in, in the actions that constitute our country. And I think that is something that we, um, you know, for some people, it's easy to, easier than others to turn away from that. And uh, I think, you know, our intention was to, to kind of force an audience to grapple with it and all of the issues within it, all the complicated issues within it and you know and by saying i don't think we necessarily have the answers to the questions it poses but i think for us it was important to to um you know ask the audience to feel what it was like um and hopefully giving the proper context emotional context to, to put you in that moment that's all really really good and yeah that's really true yeah i don't i don't um Specifically, your question about how did it, how did I engage with it? I mean, at the time, I was in terms of the events and the civil unrest in '92. I, at the time, you know, I was in middle school, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know if those specific events have necessarily shaped or changed my personal life, or if I necessarily had a relationship to it. But as someone who grew up mixed race, you know, I think I've been pretty cognizant of of my place in society from day one, you know, I've seen and heard things as, and, and been a chameleon of sorts. And I've seen and heard things from in, in a lot of different settings within a lot of different ethnic ethnicities and all you know, a lot of different communities that it's almost like having the curtain pulled back, um, on two different sides of the aisle. So I think, you know, I've always been pretty fascinated by how race specifically or the racial construct shapes us and shapes our perception. So, you know, for me, something like the events that ensued because of the, as a result of the King beating is, is just another kind of chapter in American history. It's not, it just happened to be the one that was caught on tape. And, and, and more importantly, it was the one that was caught on tape that actually was exposed to, you know, mass media picked it, the mainstream media picked it up and exposed it to the rest of the world. These types of atrocities happen day to day and and continue to happen in this day and age. So, you know, it's almost like thinking about the events of LA 92 is almost like a case study where the film is essentially just kind of holding a mirror up to ourselves. And it's less about the, I mean, we explore some of the um, basic elements of the unrest of that time and, and do a little bit of, you know, give you a little bit of a lead up and a, and a prologue, but, I think the sum 
in this case is much more about, for lack of a better term, is much more about humanity. And as you mentioned, you know, this was one of the, I think we've done projects in the past where empathy is a result of the, like the, the feeling you have leaving the theater is empathy is a result of the, the, the work itself. In this case, it was a, it was almost a little bit of a guidepost or a mission. The hope was if we can create a space that is more emo- emotive, more visceral, more experiential, the result is you get a greater sense of empathy for the realities that uh, different communities go through. And then hopefully the result of that is you have a different level of engagement when it comes to discussing race, class, and injustice. Uh, And it isn't so much of a, um, it's no longer a debate or an argument. It's uh, you're, you're, you're listening and you're discussing in ways that are hopefully more constructive um, and not destructive. Yeah, that's, that's really, really good. And I tweeted, uh, a few days ago asking my followers, Hey, what do you remember about the LA riots? What do you remember about Rodney King? What are your perceptions? What are your opinions? Just because I know that I didn't have a whole lot of experience before going into this documentary. And I was just kind of curious where other people are kind of coming at this with. And a number of people just, you know, they expressed, man, I remember being so confused or, or seeing it and, and, and just not understanding. And then there were a few other people who really came in hard with their opinions. And I found that to be really interesting, especially because so much of my experience now with understanding the LA riots is through your film. And you left me with such a deep sense of empathy for so many different people so many different groups of people that when people responded with their opinions, my immediate gut reaction was, whoa, like, but are you not hearing this other side of the story? And I think that's a testament to your filmmaking and your ability to do that, Uh, your ability to to leave people with that. I I thought that it was so interesting and because – I, I kind of assumed I would be on, you know, one team going into the going into the film and then partway through I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like these people are in the right. And then I'm like, oh wait, no. There's there's this whole other component. And it was oh man, it was I, I'm like kind of geeking out. It's it's like I'm <laughs> I love it. It was just it was great. It was fantastic. I just wanted to encourage you in that. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean that was a big part of again why we took that approach is um I don't think we didn't want to create, you know, do something that was in a, a docu journalistic endeavor because I think sometimes the result of that is you do, um, for those that don't agree with some of the decisions you made in terms of who you are, what quote unquote experts you're having deconstruct the events, they're going to tune out regardless. But if you can essentially say, look, no one can argue with what the um, emotional experience was for uh, people that lived through it then you start to hopefully you start to actually build bridges and, and we're, we're speaking the same language and it's, it's not about opinions anymore. It's about kind of the real reality of the circumstances. What was the process of digging through archival footage, finding archival footage, finding all of these old videos and bringing them together? I can't imagine that that was an easy process. <laughs> yeah, definitely not easy. Um, <laughs> I mean, we had, uh, we had an incredible team of people that, um, you know, devoted their, their life to, uh, helping us make this uh, <laughs> film. And, um, you know, that was a combination of, of going and uh, to the kind of traditional news networks and asking for what archival material they had, um, uh, and then just constantly pressing them for, you know, more and more raw footage. Um, you know, uh, we'd get a lot of like, here's a 30 minute of a bunch of clips and we'd be like, no, you don't understand. We're trying to make a film <laughs> that is a kind of raw, unfiltered look at this. So, um, you know, that was one challenge. Then, you know, the film is also made up of, of amateur home video and radio and, um, and even what were referred to as stringers at the time, which were, uh, people that would grab a camera and go out and film stuff and then try to sell it to, uh, the news networks. Um, so a lot of that was, that stuff just was almost like investigative work. You know, we'd, we'd 
see uh, something that was made maybe in 1994 about about uh, the civil unrest, and we'd um, look at the credits, and you know, you'd see three camera people listed, and we'd go online and search on Facebook and LinkedIn or whatever, and and try to match a name, and then send an email, and you know, one out of every. 30 times, maybe you'd get a response that would say, yeah, I'm, I'm that guy. And I, I have those tapes. Um, you know, and, and then even within that, you know, you might have a hundred hours that one minute of it is usable. (laughs) So, um, you know, it was just a process of of, investigation and, uh, detective work and, and everything. Um, and it's, you know, it was, not only is it challenging to get the material, it's challenging to construct the story. And, you know, we were putting a massive limitation on ourselves um, by saying that we weren't going to um, interview someone or have a voice of God that was going to kind of make things a bit tidier. Um, And, you know, I think that's uh, a decision that we felt right by because we didn't want to make authoritative statements about something that is to us just too nuanced, too complicated. Um, you know, our intention was to make, to make a, a piece of art really that would hopefully, you know, have an audience, engage an audience and make them question uh, things about our, our society and, and, you know, but do it in a way where we were not again, being didactic. Um, and that works for some people and for other people, it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult for them to watch something like that. Yeah, it's definitely, we've been, I feel like a lot of people in, especially in the documentary space. I mean, it's, I still think there's a misconception that a, a documentary is supposed to be one way. So there, there are those who, as Dan mentioned, you know, it, sometimes for some, the, the film ruffles their feathers uh, in a way that, is just a little uncomfortable for them because they are expecting to sit down and say, okay, this is a documentary and I'm going to learn this from this person or, you know, I'm going to be kind of, someone's going to hold my hand through um, the experience where we kind of just want to create a space. And in that space, you yourself are kind of having a conversation. You being the audience are having your own conversation, your own, dialogue and you're wrestling with your own emotions over the course of, of the 112 minutes of the film. What would you say surprised you most looking through this archival footage? What were some things you found that you were not expecting to find? In terms of like specific images or do you mean in terms of the event that like kind of the event itself, like the history of what happened? Yeah. In terms of maybe deeper things of being like, Whoa. I, I mean the event, the event itself was, you know, doing the research, um, even prior to really diving through all the archival, just doing the research, it was just, I feel like every second was, uh, wow, that's incredible. Or, you know, and some surprises were unfortunately because of the, um, approach we took to making the film, there was just no way to include that stuff because it wasn't documented or, um, but I think, I mean, for me, the biggest, thing was, um, I guess there's two. One was the murder of Latasha Harlins, who was a 15 year old teenager who was, um, shot and kill, uh, shot in the back of the head and killed by a, a store owner, a Korean woman whose name is Soon Jadu. And she, Soon Jadu is arrested and, and charged with, um, second degree murder. She was ultimately, uh, found guilty of, of voluntary manslaughter. And, by a jury and they recommended that she serve up to 12 years in prison. And, um, uh, the judge in the case went against the jury's recommendation and gave her probation and essentially set her free. And there was a videotape as well of, of this murder taking place. And, um, that, you know, as understandably enraged, uh, the community in, in South central and said, you know, it was just another, incident of, of injustice being handed down by our, um, you know, supposedly our, what we would call our justice system. And I don't think, well, I, I know that I did not know how influential that was into what transpired in Los Angeles in 
late April of 1992, that with the civil unrest, you know, we know that the Rodney King being in the subsequent trial of the police officers and then being acquitted, you know, was the spark. But uh, if you talk to people that lived through it, many will say that the murder of Latasha Harlins was, was even more impactful and was even more of a reason. Um, and that was surprising to me. The other was, was just the experience of Korean merchants um, during the actual civil unrest. I feel like in so many ways, what I saw in your documentary of these events from 25 years ago and all of the context surrounding them, they felt so familiar. Racial injustice, police brutality, troops in the Middle East and rationing water in California, like all of these things, big and small, feel like 2017 in many ways. Do you think that we've seen growth and change in the last 25 years since the LA riots? Do you think that there's hope for growth and change in the next 25 years? I mean, that's the, that's the big question, right? <laughs> um, I, I think, um, you know, I think it would be naive to say that we haven't progressed um, as a society in any way, you know, because I think there, you can't deny that um, there's been some form of democratization of, of opportunity. But in that same token, I think it's equally naive to assume that we all have equal access to those opportunities. Um, I think there's kind of like a, there's almost like an unspoken caste system that's directly related to color and wealth that uh, I don't think we acknowledge that kind of shapes our our perceptions of us, of ourselves. And until we start having a more frank conversation about those disparities, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll make progress in the way in which we say that we'd like to make progress or the way in which we say that we have ha- made progress. But I think, I think if we, you know, I think a lot of that lies in, you know, in my opinion, I think a lot of it lies in education. And there's a there's a moment in the film that actually didn't end up getting used, but there was a uh, they did a NPR did an interview with a young high school student up in uh, the Bay Area who was holding rallies at our high school. Uh, they were holding peace rallies on I think the third day of of the unrest, and they interviewed this young you know she was I think a junior or senior at the time, and her. Um, they were kind of asking her the same thing, you know, how do we, do you, do you have hope for your generation and the future of your generation? And her answer was, you know, I think, I think she said something to the effect of, you know, I think Latinos need to educate Latinos, Asians need to educate Asians and whites need to educate whites and blacks need to educate blacks. And I think the point she was kind of making was essentially like the United States of America being a mixed salad, uh, you know, society comprised of, immigrants from all different cultures, you can't deny that some form of multicultural education is imperative. And we just, we don't put value on that. Um, and if we can, you know, put more of a value that on, of, on that on, uh, you know, early childhood ed, and um, maybe then we will actually start to understand each other a little bit better. And we will actually start to be communicating, you know, speaking the same language for lack of better terms. So if we can, again, put more value on each other's experiences and realities, then, then I, I do think that things can certainly progress. But but until then, I think, you know, it, it is a bit of a, you know, two steps forward, two steps backwards. Yeah, I'd just add that the there is a kind of inherent, I always describe it as this kind of inherent cognitive dissonance in the American experience. Um, and so, like TJ said, I, I think it would be naive to say that we, haven't made progress in 25 years, but, you know, it would be equally naive to say that we have solved the problems that or solved any of the problems <laughs> that led to the events that happened in 1992. And so I think that's the, you know, there was a, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates did a profile of, of President Obama in the you know, final months of his administration. And after Donald Trump won, he went and spoke with him and, and he reported about Obama speaking to his staff and saying, because he had always, you know, he'd said many times, uh, quoting, I believe Martin Luther King, the moral, uh, the moral arc 
the universe uh, bends towards justice. And Obama then said to his staff, you know, it's just, we have to remember that it zigs and zags as well. And we also have to remember, as I heard ta Coates saying to Ezra Klein in an interview, that a lot of people die in those zigs and zags, and that reality is hard to deal with. Um, so I think the challenge for our society is to be able to be comfortable in that cognitive dissonance, to know that we make progress, but it might not but that progress might also come at the expense of other things. And I'm not saying that our society is a giant zero sum game. I don't believe that at all, but I, um, but I do think that we have to be comfortable uh, and only can we be only when we are comfortable with the idea that contradictions exist inherently in our society, that then we can actually talk about them and find solutions. But I think we, we often want to, when these realities are, when we're faced with these realities, we, we want to retreat to more comfortable spaces. And that oftentimes leads to polarization. Mm. Maybe we could dive into that a tiny bit more, this idea of retreating into comfortable spaces and, and how that creates polarization. Because I think that is maybe what we're seeing. I think that uh, in 2017, addressing the injustices of the world is difficult. It is not easy, especially when you or people like you are the ones who are are allowing for these injustices. Maybe let's bring it back a tiny bit and say, how do you think that the LA riots have impacted the movement for racial justice today? And kind of what does their legacy and impact look like right here, right now? It's a that's a tough question because I, yeah. I, I think the, you know, I think you take a, a, a movement in an organization like Black Lives Matters, and I don't, I don't think, I think, for example, the, the unrest in 92, the civil unrest in 92 is one of many chapters in American history that essentially lead to something like a, a, a movement like Black Lives Matter. And you know, I think in, as long as there is marginalized communities that are getting different treatment than the dominant culture, then you will have, you will continue to have movements like that organization. So I think something like uh, kind of the events that occurred in 92 are kind of part of just the larger series of uh, of systemic kind of injustices that kind of have existed since the kind of the birth of the nation uh, and every, every time there's kind of a something that allows us all to recognize as being wrong and it kind of comes in waves and it, and it, it boils up to the surface and it becomes part of the zeitgeist. That's that essentially is just going to continue to give birth to uh, new voices and new movements that are, you know, hopefully becoming a voice on behalf of the ways, those that don't uh, that are voiceless. So uh, to answer your question, I think, I just think personally, I think the, un, the, the unrest of 92 is just, is just a chapter um, that has led to kind of formations like uh, Black Lives Matter and, and, the, and, and society today in 2017. Mm. I feel like the podcast listeners are this like beautiful community who want to use their unique talents and abilities to make a difference in the world and maybe even zooming in a little bit closer, they want to create empathy. They want to create understanding for the sake of forward momentum. And and that's something that you guys are fantastic at. And I think you've done that incredibly well with this new film. For listeners who want to follow in your footsteps, not necessarily to become Dan and TJ, but to become themselves and live into their talents and abilities to create impact and empathy what kind of advice would you give them? Where would you tell people to start? Something like actionable. <laughs> I mean, I have one thing, but it's kind of esoteric, I guess. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I feel like there is a, I feel like people need to understand that this is going to, this is going to sound possibly naive, but like, but that we are all human beings and that if you are approaching work like this, 
from a place of like, I represent this community and I am going to like speak about that community. I'm going to help, you know, you are inherently missing the point in my opinion. Like if to speak directly to what we're talking about and with, with the film, we have to remember as TJ alluded to earlier, like race is a, a construct, you know, it was made up, but we, we can't just, live in a world where you go, well, race was made up, so let's forget about that and let's all be <laughs> colorblind because that's horribly naive. Mm-hmm. The, the, that construct is so ingrained in our society and in our country that you can't ignore it. So again, there's this cognitive dissonance of like, uh, that's not a real thing, but yet it's the most impactful thing in our everyday experiences. But, uh, and I say all of that to say, in my opinion, the way we can move forward as a country is to somehow get beyond that, but you can't get beyond that if we are still approaching things as us versus them or like I even even when you're doing good deeds, you know you, mm-hmm. it can't come from a place of like paternalism, like, oh, I'm going to help this person because they need my help, and I think that is oftentimes I see that oftentimes in people that have very good intentions, but they're not self-aware enough to know that, um, yeah, their intentions might be perceived the wrong way. That's really, really good. Since, since Dan, since Dan went with the esoteric, I'm going to go with some more practical. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think there's, I would say there's two things that stand out to me. One is what Dan touched on earlier, uh, in the discussion is listen. I think listening is an, underrated tool that we all that's free and we all have access to. Um, I think there's just too often people and they have their own agenda and they don't recognize that they're not, that they're plowing through projects or work or life with their agenda um, and are not actually opening up their ears um, and actually truly listening to the stories and people in the world around them. Um, I think the other thing is hone your craft, whether it's, whether you are, want to be, you do want to be a filmmaker, a writer, photographer, um, whatever, whatever it is that your, your medium is, is hone it. I think as Dan says, like, I think people, there's a lot of people with great intentions out there. Um, I think without honing your craft, th- those intentions can certainly get lost in translation. Um, there's to know what is, what is almost exploitative in your work, you know, even though your intention was not to be exploitative, to know what is feeding or perpetuating stereotypes in your work, even though that may not have been your, your, your intention, you got to continue to hone your craft and, and be open to criticism um, and make yourself better at what you do so that you open up those channels where what your intention is, is actually being articulated through whatever medium is that you're exploring. exploring. So I would say, listen, and listen, 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 and spend time honing your, your skill set for sure. Man, that's absolutely fantastic advice. You guys, this is so fantastic. I'm, I'm honored that I got to have this conversation with you guys. I admire you both a lot. Your film is fantastic. Um, and I'm so excited for people to, uh, to hear your story and to, to check out the film. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. I seriously am so blown away by Dan and TJ's unique ability to build empathy with the work that they create. (sighs) That inspires me a whole lot. I feel like I have so much to learn from them. They do such a good job. I especially loved that advice that they gave about getting rid of your own preconceptions and listening to others. I think that that is key for the work that we create and the, the way that we want to make an impact. I think we sometimes just have to get out of our own way and kind of trust others by listening. If you want to watch LA 92, and and trust me, you do, it premieres on National Geographic on April 30th at 9, 8 central. If you haven't already, check out our brand new website, goodgoodgood.co. That's .co. It is so fun. We just redesigned it and it encapsulates everything that we are about. 
We have the podcast, Sounds Good. We have the good newsletter and we have the good newspaper all under one roof at goodgoodgood.co. Um, it's super fun. I would say go check it out. I think it gives a little bit better context for what we care about, who we are, and what this community of people who listen to the podcast, subscribe to the newsletter, purchase the newspaper all around the world, what we're about. Go check it out. On that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week, and we'll be back next Monday with another conversation with an inspiring person. Sound good?